Well, welcome to The Common Core Does Not Have to Be a Great Wall, Fun Ways to Teach About China. My name is Keith Matea. I am a Senior Program Director here with the Constitutional Rights Foundation. And hi, I'm Carrie Doggett, and I'm the Director of Program at the Constitutional Rights Foundation. And we're thrilled to have so many of you joining us. We're seeing some of you from the East Coast, some of you are local, and we hope everything in between. I'm going to start off with a trivia question here. Uh, for you, those of you who don't know, one of the sort of greatest archaeological discoveries uh, in the world is the Terracotta Army in China. And we wanted to know uh, what percentage of the famous Terracotta Army has already been uncovered? Well, it looks like most of you do know the answer. The answer is 25%. So they figure it's going to take centuries yet to uncover the entire army. Uh, I didn't know until fairly recently that all of the different figures uh, in the army I have different facial expressions and slight differences in their dress. They're all individuals, which I thought is a pretty, pretty interesting fact, the amount of effort that went into uh, carving all these statues. Uh, or I should say car carving all these terracotta warriors. They're not made out of stone. They're made out of terracotta. Um, I should also note, for those of you who don't know, uh, this army was constructed to defend the first Chinese emperor in the afterlife. Uh, so there's a large number of soldiers, but there's also, uh, they've uncovered servants and, and other figures uh, to protect him in his tomb. Moving on here uh, to our lesson, our lessons, uh, we want to ask, what's the most challenging part of teaching Chinese history? So maybe if people can put some answers over in the chat bar uh, and we can talk a little bit about those challenges. Not enough time to teach all the good stuff. Yes, that would be a problem. There is a lot to learn. It is a long history. Many pre-existing biases. Any, any thoughts on what those pre-existing biases might be? The idea of dynasties can be challenging for students. Yes, that is definitely something that is hard to keep track of. Yes, the words are difficult, difficult to pronounce. Uh, and one thing you'll see in the lessons that we've provided and that we're going to be talking about today, and we do have a pronunciation guide uh, for each of the lessons. Where to start and where to begin in a timely manner for middle schoolers. I think that's a really uh, interest, interesting point to make there uh, because it is something that they may not have a lot of exposure to uh, beforehand. Um, a personal lack of knowledge uh, on the extensive history. Hopefully, I, I hope our lessons uh, are useful for providing you some, some resources for teaching China even if you don't have a lot of uh, knowledge of Chinese history. I thought in terms of going through these lessons, I see a lot of people are saying here um, they don't have a knowledge of the history. And again, I, I'm hoping our lessons are helpful for them. Uh, lack of background, narrowing it down. Uh, I think I, I'm hoping our lessons here help you to see some big subjects that you can talk about. And I think you know that covers a lot of different problems I think teachers usually run across. So what we're going to present today are four lessons for teaching China. Uh, we have a picture here from Chinese history. This is actually Mongol soldiers. Uh, those are the ones on the horses uh, chasing uh, Chinese soldiers. Um, if you can see in the picture, uh, inter I think it's interesting. This is a Chinese art. Uh, so this is not pictures from that Mongols would have created. And it's interesting that all the figures, uh, Chinese and Mongols, are dressed in Chinese armor. Um, so that's something that I think is always interesting to note. Um, where does the art come from? And how are people being represented? And that's important to see here that the Chinese represent everyone as Chinese soldiers. I also like how this picture shows that the Chinese soldiers have Weapons are actually constructed to take people off horses. And they've got little hooks and whatnot on the, on the long weapons to pull people off. We're going to really present parts of a four-lesson unit today. And each one of the lessons, and by the way, you are going to get the entire unit. We'll have a link where you can download it for free after the webinar. And you'll see that each lesson provides an overview of procedures, all the handouts that students would need. Really, everything you need, and like I said, you're going to get all four of these lessons at the end of the webinar. Um, Keith's going to tell us a little more about each one of the lessons, and then we're going to dive in to a couple of the lessons. I see over here, um, I just want to go back to a point that was made. Um, I was in the same boat. Often, Asian and African history were taught from the European perspective, but not for their own merit. I think it's really interesting. This picture actually portrays battles between uh, the Chinese uh, and Mongol armies, which at the time, this is the 13th century, dwarfed any battles or wars or conflicts going on in the Middle East or in Europe. And yet it's seen as a sort of secondary thing to teach in history, when in reality at the time, like this was the biggest historical event. 
So I always thought it'd be interesting if you were teaching history, why, why couldn't you teach Chinese history from the perspective of China for a lot of you know, the world history being kind of the most important country? Uh, so I know it's just an interesting thing to take into account. So going through our lessons, our first lesson here, you get, a, you get an idea here of what the overview is and what some of the objectives are for learning about ancient history. And our first lesson, and we're not going to, our focus is going to be on our second lesson and then talking about the Silk Road lesson as well. Uh, our first lesson, it's really important, I think the takeaways for it, uh, is geography is really important. Uh, and I think for middle school students, that's a really good intro to understanding history. Things like rivers, deserts, uh, steppe, mountains, the ocean, uh, and letting students think critically about the role of these in establishing civilization, not only in China, but in other regions of the world. Obviously, the focus is here on China. Um, the lesson also covers uh, writing and Chinese writing and how writing is invented or comes out of pictograms. So I think that's another really important thing for students to understand how, how culture and how civilization really begins. There's a really cool activity, too, Jitha, where students can write their own messages using um, Chinese pictograms, too. Thank you, Carrie. You're absolutely right. There's a, a really cool activity with it, as Carrie has noted. Our second lesson, which we're going to cover us in more depth here, uh, is on Confucianism and Taoism. And the real takeaways for this activity is you really see how ideas and how philosophy or how thinking is really important in shaping culture uh, and how differences in those ideas, and here we're focusing on two different sets of ideas, Confucianism and Taoism, matter. It, the, there's different ways to approach culture, how things happen, uh, change based on how people think. Uh, what we're going to see is that we are using, we're integrating sayings from Chinese philosophy uh, to get students to really think about um, how, how ideas work in culture. And again, we're going to have you all do a little activity with that. Lessons, lesson three focuses on Chinese law. And uh, Sha Huangdi was the first Chinese emperor. Uh, you'll, you might know him. Uh, have any of you seen the movie The Mummy, Tomb of the, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor? He is the uh, emperor being betrayed there. Uh, also, the very first movie I ever dragged my dad to that had subtitles called Hero. It was the first big budget Chinese movie. Uh, it talks about or is focused on him as well. Uh, so he's a pretty important character or figure in Chinese history and really in world history. Uh, and this lesson really focuses on his establishment of, uh, chi of law in China uh, under the first uh, Chinese dynasty, the Qin dynasty. Finally, we have a lesson on the Silk Road. Uh, this, and we're going to, at the end of, end of our webinar here, look at the activity for this lesson. And really the takeaway for this lesson is that trade has an influence on culture and trade has an influence, a powerful influence on economy. Uh, and part of the lesson is to, for students to see outside of just China and see uh, connections to, for example, modern day America. Uh, and not only that, obviously students see from this lesson how the Silk Road worked. And it's largely misunderstood, misunderstood because it's not really a road. So getting students to understand the the actual logistics of how trade happened in ancient times and Middle Ages is important. And I think they learn a lot from that. I see here, I finally know the correct pronunciation of the Qin Dynasty. So for those of you who don't know, that is why we have, why we call China, China uh, from that first di dynasty. It's not really the first dynasty, but the, that particular dynasty is the first as seen of uniting um, much of what is modern day China. So we're going to dive in here to Confucianism and Taoism uh, and comparing the two. Here we have on the, in our picture here, this is a picture of Confucius. Uh, Confucius lived, you see the dates down below uh, underneath the picture for when he lived. Um, this is not a contemporary picture. We don't actually know what he looks like. Uh, I didn't think this was a particularly good piece of art, uh, so that's why I put this picture up. Um, it's also from our lesson. So all, all the artwork in our webinar here is actually from our lessons. So just briefly going through for those of you who don't know anything about Confucius, uh, and these questions, by the way, that we have up on the slides are actually the questions from the lessons. So this is not something outside of uh, what you're, you're going to get when you actually see, see them. So we say, what was life like in China and at the time of Confucius? And then what do we know about the life of Confucius? And the real takeaway that you want to get from this is that Confucius is re responding to a China and Chinese history but there's no central government and lots of disorder, war, starvation, and other problems in the countryside. The other takeaway, I think, for understanding Confucius, is sort of understanding really who he is as a person, is wisdom is really the most important thing. And wisdom here is not just about learning 
reading, writing, and arithmetic, uh, or reading books. Wisdom can be archery. Wisdom can be about driving chariots. And if you're going to explain it to your students, it might be, you, know, you could be wise learning to play basketball or baseball or football really well. And for Confucius, getting good at something, becoming wise at, at some activity is about building good habits. And it's important in a large variety of activities, not just learning in school as we think about it. Very interesting stuff. But in total, how many days, hours will these lessons take? Say six days six. maximum. And I don't know what, who, I don't, I'm not sure who's asking the question, where they're from. But at least in California, there's a, an entire unit on ancient China. And so all of these lessons were tightly aligned to the content standards. It is standards aligned in terms of what students are supposed to know about. I see someone asking, can you share those movie titles in print uh, from earlier? Uh, I think we could. I will send out an email. I'll make sure to include those in the email. Highly recommend the movie Hero. Again, the Chinese government put a ton of money into making a really cool history movie. After Confucius, the uh, lesson we have on Confucianism talks about also what is Confucianism. Uh, you have obviously the historical figure, but his you know, thinking and his writing led to a school of thought that is influential to this day in China. Uh, the, lesson covered, the lesson really focuses on using the Chinese terms a Ren, Yi, Dei, uh, and Li to help explain uh, Confucian thoughts. Uh, so students not only learn Confucian thought, but they learn something about the terminology uh, as well at the same time. And just one, one thing to note, uh, in addition to, I guess, pr presenting Confucian thought in four easily digestible terms, uh, what you see at the end is being good means something like doing your duty, and that leads to an orderly society. So if, that, if the students were going to take away anything, that's what you'd want them to see uh, from the lesson. The lesson also talks about Taoism, oh, its origins, uh, and what, what it means. Uh, if you're going to get any sort of takeaways about Taoism, the first thing I would probably have students think about is Taoism is really a response to Confucianism. So it's a rejection of what Taoists think Confucianism means uh, and trying to establish a different way of thinking about what it means to be good, what it means to be wise. So that's, not, that's the first thing. The second thing is it's, it really focuses on the idea that Taoism is mysterious. Taoism is not clear into what, what things mean. And it's supposed to be a little bit unclear. My, my sort of experience from teaching different philosophies is some students like something like Confucianism where the answers are really clear. Like you do this, you do that, and you get a result. And some students really like a more uh, mysterious, a little more, uh, I, guess, I don't know, you could call it a uh, poetic version of philosophy that leaves things a little more open-ended. The main differences from the lesson, Confucianism is more practical. As I was saying, Taoism is more mysterious, uh, less clear. I think another difference is, as I was, again, I'm just repeating myself with this, Confucianism, uh, Taoism is, uh, thinks that there are the, the basic tenets of Confucianism uh, actually are detrimental to society, or can be detrimental to society. Uh, it is important, I think, to see that there are similarities between the two, and the lesson does point these out as well. Uh, they both think rulers should be just. They both uh, think that they're both dealing with a situation where society is disordered. Uh, Confucianism is sometimes described as a philosophy and sometimes as a religion. Uh, what would you say is more accurate? Um, I would say it, it, we, we, we present it as a, more as a philosophy, Certainly, there are changes over time with Confucianism. You'll see sometimes people talking about Neo-Confucianism. Um, but here's really presented as a philosophy of life. Uh, Taoism is also presented as both. Taoism can be seen as a philosophy. Taoism can be seen primarily as a religion. Uh, in this lesson, we're really presenting them both as philosophies. And philosophy means something like a, just approaches to life. Uh, because there are two, two approaches to life that both have really profound effects on Chinese history. We're actually going to move in here and have less of me talking and more of you all doing some fun activities that are actually in the lessons. So we're going to be looking at four scenarios that we actually have in the lesson and have you decide, have all of you decide which of the sayings that we're going to put up, uh, you'll see on the screen, you think best uh, fits the situation. So our first scenario is Chris, a friend of yours, needs help with math homework. You try and explain how to do the problems, but Chris says, stop, just tell me the answers. So what you'll see over on the right are 
three different sayings, either from Taoism or Confucianism. And vote on, after you process the scenario, uh, decide which of the sayings you think provides the best response to the scenario. All these sayings, by the way, are part of the lesson. Well, it seems like we have a clear winner here. All right. We, we have a very clear winner here. It looks like B. Uh, in the lessons, our focus I, for, the, for these scenarios is, is not that we want students to, that there's a right answer. There is a right answer. B actually does, it is the right answer. Or I, I, sh I should say the suggested answer. The idea is for students to read the sayings and then really be able to think critically about why they chose the saying that they chose. So another way to get students to address that, what would the saying we chose recommend doing in the situation? Well, all of you are uh, quite wise in your uh, sort of ability to rephrase here uh, Confucius and his uh, analects. All right, we're going to move on to scenario two here. Scenario two, you have a huge project due for school in a month. You have to write a paper and give an oral report. You feel it is just too much work, and you think you will never get it done. You have three more choices again. The first two are Dallas sayings, and the last is one from Confucius. Wow, it looks like we have a clear winner again. I tried to make these, so on the actual lesson, uh, students get uh, a list of about a dozen sayings from both, both Confucianism and Taoism. You'll see that they actually have to go through more different sayings. Uh, here we've limited it for a, a webinar. All right, I think again we have a clear winner. A seems to be a clear winner. So again, what would you, what would the saying we chose recommend doing this situation? All right, we have some good responses over here on the side. Again, I feel uh, all of you have a very firm grasp on uh, both Confucianism and Taoist philosophy. We'll see any more. Let's see. Start small, little by little, uh, it will get done. All these are very, very good. All right, so I think we're going to move on now to scenario three. Scenario three, you are the captain of a basketball team. Jamie, a player on your team, is not a good player and takes wild shots trying to show off. The other players want you to do something about Jamie because your team is losing its games. Jamie has to play because you only have five players and you cannot get a replacement. So again, read the different sayings and pick the one that you think is the best one. For any of you who are, who are choosing, it looks like we have another clear winner, but for any of you who choose one that is not the apparent suggested answer, I'd love to see in the chat bar why you think that's a better answer. There's really no right or wrong answers here. There's a suggested answer. I think you see, the, see clearly which one that's going to be. But you shouldn't see the other possibilities as wrong answers. Well, I see some, some good responses for B being better. Uh, let's see here. The, better, the best rulers are scarcely known by their subjects. When rulers finish their work on a job, everyone says, we did it. That's a very, very good phrase for uh, understanding teamwork. Uh, we have some great responses here. Uh, I think we're going to move on to the final scenario, scenario four. Scenario four, to give your parents a surprise, you spent Saturday cleaning house while they were away. Your younger brother and older sister did not help. They watched TV. When your parents returned home, your brother and sister said to them, look what we did. We cleaned the house for you. My brother actually did that once to me when I was young. So again, you have three choices over on the poll. Uh, please pick what you think of the best answer is. I sometimes uh, joke with my brother that I wish I was an only child. Uh, I am the older of the two, so he typically does not appreciate that. Most of it, I don't necessarily like the best answer. Most, maybe you want to elaborate on that. Is that for the last scenario or for this scenario? Andrea writes, uh, A works, but I like the idea of B as well. Uh, my sister would have totally done this. Yeah, I think lots of siblings would be doing this. That's why I think this is an amusing scenario. Maybe in the chat bar, just like our last scenario, if you chose B, we had a few people choose B here, and we had someone else choose C. Uh, maybe elaborate more on why you chose B. As you can see here, I've, I've mixed up the, you know, with the different scenarios. I, I've tried to include two, two of one uh, from Dao, two from Taoism, or one from Confucius, or vice versa. 
again, though, for the lessons themselves, students can pick through all of the, all of the sayings. Um, I think I've included uh, in, this sort of, in these four scenarios most of the uh, different quotations that are used in the lessons. Danielle puts, I like the emphasis on unimportance. Uh, Danielle, that's an interesting point. Uh, maybe say something more about why you think that's important. I feel this is a very philosophical webinar. I'm learning a lot from your, your chat. I'm also, I'm happy to see that, you know, with this very philosophical chat that's going on, I hope you can all see that it really, these scenarios and this activity can really get your students to think in interesting ways. Julian puts that kids may have very different responses than us. Uh, this will be interesting to get their perspective. Yeah, and I think that's fine. Uh, if a student chooses a different, as I said earlier, a different scenario or different answer to a scenario, that's fine as long as they have a, a good response and they think critically about why they chose what they did. This would be good for group cohesion. Yeah, this would be a, a great group activity. You could definitely have them work in um, pairs or in larger, larger groups to come up with uh, answers. We have, uh, without philosophy of individualism, Americans in general uh, do not embrace an importance. Uh, it would be interesting for kids to think about this concept and why it might be a good thing. Uh, I think that's a really good point. I think a lot of what we think about in terms of just general life and individualism and, and how we approach our lives uh, is very different from uh, both Confucianism and Taoism. So I think it's a very good learning tool for getting students to think in some different ways. All right, well, we're going to move beyond the scenario, scenario four here. Let's see, any final comments? Good Socratic seminar. Yeah, I actually, uh, when I first started learning about Confucius and taught, taught Confucius, actually, uh, the reason I was really, uh, was really appealing to me is very similar, I think, to uh, Greek philosophy, which is uh, more of my background. So I think, and I've seen students respond really in, in interesting ways to Confucianism and Taoism. All right. Is anyone seeing any alignment to Common Core or any other new state standards? Some of the things that I wanted to just point out are that, first, we're using complex texts. First, let's talk about the complex texts. Now, you all didn't actually see the reading that goes with this, but you did see the source documents in those sayings that we showed you. And so the point I want to make is, you know, using complex texts, you don't have to use really long texts, nor do you have to use texts that have a lot of difficult vocabulary. The point is that students need to deal with the meaning of that text and do that in terms of the context of when it was written, and in this situation, also how that text applies to situations today. They're using source documents. And the activity that we came up with there, where the students are looking at the text and then uh, thinking about the modern day scenarios, actually has the students go back and forth repeatedly between the scenario and that text, back and forth, back and forth. And each time that they visit it, they're going to you know, analyze it a little bit more, become more familiar with it, and then take a deeper dive into the meaning. And then the other thing that we thought was kind of cool about this particular lesson is around the issue of relevance. You know, we're looking at ancient texts and comparing it to or making it relevant to modern day scenarios. And so, you know, that is, I think, a really good thing to do. Um, not only, you know, to get students to really appreciate history, but it's also one of the best practices in in civic learning as well. And I wanted to you know, congratulate Keith on pointing out that this would be a perfect group activity. In fact, uh, we would recommend that you definitely have students do this activity, at least in pairs, if not in small groups, because it is the discussion about the text. It is the discussion that students have in trying to make meaning out of it and then um, compare that meaning to the, to the scenarios. And then finally, the other point I wanted to make was Keith kept saying the suggested right answer. You'll see in the teacher materials there are suggested answers. But this is another you know, nice opportunity to really engage your students in critical thinking by accepting whatever claim they make as long as they can back it up with reason and evidence. So that's kind of what I wanted to point out. Are there any other, in your mind, connections to Common Core that I haven't touched upon? Carrie, I'm going to jump in here for a second. Certainly feel free to comment on Common Core. Uh, someone wrote uh, in the comments here, 
uh, that students have a, you know, trouble explaining why, you know, why they make choices, why they would make choices. And what I really love about this lesson is it gives them a scenario that they can relate to, and then the explanation of the complex uh, primary source text allows them basically to put the put their own put their own spin on what it means uh, in relation to the scenario that they have. So they're kind of uh, I th like to think of it as being tricked into explaining a primary uh, source complex a primary source and a complex text. So when Chief and I were planning this webinar, we came up with this idea, you know, as an extension. So I'm going to let Keith tell you about that since you can hear him best. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, I see someone asking, does this activity come with many scenarios? How many? The answer is four, and you've actually seen all four of them. In any case, we're going to be moving on here. We do have a cool new bonus activity, which we have uh, worked on and developed here, uh, similar to what you just did, but kind of working backwards. So instead of having a scenario and picking a, uh, a saying that goes with it, we're going to take a, say take a saying first and then write a scenario. Now, I know, unfortunately, that was going to be impossible to do over in the uh, dialog bar. Uh, we don't want to be sitting here all day while people are trying to type out scenarios. Uh, so just you know, something to think about oh, as, we, as I read through it here. Uh, Confucius said, when you see a good man, think of becoming like him. When you see someone not so good, reflect on your weak points. I think this activity can be done with any of the sayings in the lesson. Uh, I just particularly like this one. I don't know what it tells you about myself, but I think it is a good philosophy for life. So just to give you an idea of what a student might write, I try to do a humorous scenario to go with this particular saying. So this is a saying you have. You are eating lunch with Baron Von Bumble. You know he never eats his vegetables and instead secretly hides them in his big black hat until he can throw them away. Your mother always packs you a healthy apple in your lunch, but you do not like fruit very much. The Baron tells you he would not tell anyone if you tossed your or if you toss your apple in the garbage. So my explanation for this, the reason I use, I thought this was an amusing response. Going back here for a second, uh, when you see someone not so good, reflect on your own weak points. Obviously, we have a character here who is not so good uh, in doing uh, bad things and not eating his vegetables. Uh, instead of you doing something bad like him, uh, it makes you reflect on your own uh, poten potential issues or weak spots. In this case, not wanting to eat your fruit that your mother packed you, and instead of throwing it away, hopefully in this scenario, you would take the advice of Confucius and eat your apple, even if you don't like fruit, because you realize it's a weak part of who you are, you use this to improve yourself. We have here focus on positive, respecting others, not being boastful. Yeah, I think, you, I think you see a lot of that in Chinese philosophy. And again, I, I've said it before, but with a lot of these, with a lot of these sayings and a lot of, you know, both for, for both Confucianism and Taoism, uh, it gives students a totally different perspective on, on how to approach uh, situations. So you find inspiration from both good and bad for your own well-being. Yes, I think that's a very good point for this scenario. And again, thank you all for, I, I've said it a couple of times, but I've been really, really impressed with uh, the, the comments over here. Promote character, education, sort of sneaking it in. Yes, there is an idea. I, I certainly think uh, with this lesson that uh, you can uh, sneak into uh, students' background or sneak into students' uh, education some, some ethics. I always love where you can combine philosophy, ethics, and history. You'll obviously have access to uh, this PowerPoint and these activities and all of our lessons, uh, but we do want you to see a way that you can get students to write using this lesson. Uh, so remember, this is if you want to use it, it's not in the lesson plan we will give you. Now, this is uh, a new uh, activity that we've included. Uh, certainly, it, you can think of it as a sort of extra, as I said, bonus activity. So we're going to end here on something we're going to call the Silk Road Challenge. So I know in the description for the webinar, uh, we said that we were going to have you all do a Silk Road Challenge, but we decided to change things up a little and, and do the philosophy lesson instead, or focus on the philosophy lesson and activity and set. Uh, so the Silk Road Challenge is really going to be a challenge for all of you. This map here I have is actually from the lesson. Um, the points on the map are uh, prominent points along the quote-unquote Silk Road uh, that students uh, take and they label indivi the individual points uh, on you know, the Silk Road as it moves from the borders of, of ancient China uh, eventually into India and to Europe and the Middle East across the Takmakan Desert. 
So here you have the actual activity from the lesson. So the lesson, of course, includes a reading about the Silk Road and its importance. Uh, we have an, you, you will have a, uh, access to that as well, of course. But here's the activity for, for the actual lesson. Uh, how many of you, I guess you can say this yes or no, uh, know about the old video game Oregon Trail? We have a few no's. For those of you who don't know what Oregon Trail is, Oregon Trail was a video game from my youth uh, in the 80s uh, where we learned about uh, westward expansion. And something that I think a lot of people don't know is the game actually was not random. So the sort of premise of the game was you started in Missouri and you were part of a family that was moving to Oregon. And various things could happen to you along this road. Now, the things that happened to you were not, were not random, actually. Uh, the people who put together the game actually went into the historical data and they found out things like the probability of things really happening to people. So it wasn't a, uh, it was a very, very uh, sort of accurate simulation of, of moving or going across the country in a caravan from Missouri to Oregon. And our Silk Road activity is in part a way to simulate things in the same way. So you would be a trader um, moving along the Silk Road, trading from China into eventually India or the Middle East. Uh, so this is a lesson. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, I should say this is not the lesson, this is the activity for the lesson. And here you have uh, a bunch of different things that can happen along uh, the Silk Road as your students are trying to trade silk up and down the road. So you have you know, bandits attack and steal all of your silk and camels. You're lucky not to be taken captive. So the activity is set up that you take these squares, you cut them into the boxes, you throw them in a bowl, uh, students, as they go along the Silk Road, things randomly happen. And what we're challenging you all to do is improve this lesson that I just had on the last slide to make it something a little more uh, deliberate and a little more um, focused on critical thought. If you take a look at the lesson and it's something that you do want to improve, we, as you're part of the Silk Road Challenge, will give you full credit for improving the lesson. We think it's very cool already, um, but we'd love to see your improvements. And there's a possibility that we could give you a stipend as well uh, if you improve the lesson. Just to give you an idea here, we, you do see here a northern route and a southern route. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about the Silk Road, as I said earlier, it wasn't really a road. It was really a set of trading posts uh, that people moved between. And the Silk Road is basically having students choose whether they're going to take the northern route of it or the southern route of it. Um, both, both of them uh, tried to move around the, the worst parts of the Takamakan Desert. Uh, Heather says, my student love these types of activities. Well, we love doing these types of activities too. What we would love to see from all of you is, again, a way to make this activity a little more deliberate and a little more interesting than it already is. I'll uh, move on to the second slide. Uh, this gives you a sort of, there's two pages uh, in the lesson. So these are part of the handouts for it. So you see some of the other possibility, possibilities of things that can happen to your students as they traverse the Silk Road, either on its northern route or its southern route. Where do we send our improvements to this lesson? Uh, that's a good question. You can send those to me. Uh, you'll see my email at the end of this webinar. Uh, so I'll tell students to Google Silk Road or they will get lots of info on drugs. Oh my gosh, that is a really important. Thank you for pointing that out. So the Silk Road obviously has been taken as a um, name of a I think website, if I'm not mistaken, where people were selling drugs. So yes, that is, I wouldn't tell them not to Google Silk Road. I would just tell them to be very careful with what they see. Um, I do want to point out, thank you all of you for uh, being here at our webinar. We do have two more coming up soon. Uh, one is civic engagement right, plus writing, a commonly good idea. And that's going to be next Tuesday, uh, 4.30 to 6.30 Pacific time. So I just want to make that perfectly clear, that specific time. Uh, we'll be with, actually with the authors, of, the authors of the book will be part of the webinar. So uh, there's been a great book on civic engagement and writing, as we as just said, and the authors are going to be talking with us uh, here at CRF. Finally, on Thursday, we have our final uh, webinar of the fall, uh, and that's on teaching from primary sources, uh, three successful strategies for middle school and high school teachers. So we'll be using a variety of different sources um, and some different ways to use those sources to get students to think critically and to write as well. For support and information, please contact me at keith at crf.usa.org. Uh, Carrie, also, uh, you feel free to contact her if you have questions. It's Carrie at CRF.
usa.org. Thank all of you. It was fantastic to hear all of your comments. Today are four lessons for teaching China. Uh, we have a picture here from Chinese history. This is actually Mongol soldiers. Uh, those are the ones on the horses uh, chasing uh, Chinese soldiers. Um, if you can see in the picture, uh, I think it's interesting. This is a Chinese art, uh, so it's not pictures from that Mongols would have created. And it's interesting that all the figures, uh, Chinese and Mongols, are dressed in Chinese armor. Um, so that's something that I think is always interesting to note. Um, where does the art come from, and how are people being represented? And that's important to see here that the Chinese represent everyone as Chinese soldiers. I also like how this picture shows that the Chinese soldiers have weapons that are actually constructed to take people off horses. And they've got little hooks and live percents. So they figure it's going to take centuries yet to uncover the entire army. Uh, I didn't know until fairly recently that all of the different figures uh, in the army actually have different facial expressions and slight differences in their dress. They're all individuals, which I thought is a pretty, pretty interesting fact, the amount of effort that went into uh, carving all these statues. Uh, or I should say car carving all these terracotta warriors. They're not made out of stone. They're made out of terracotta. Um, I should also note, for those of you who don't know, uh, this army was constructed to defend the first Chinese emperor in the afterlife. Uh, so there's a large number of soldiers, but there's also, uh, they've uncovered servants and, and other figures uh, to protect him. And it's where to start and where to begin in a timely manner for middle schoolers. I think that's a really uh, interest, interesting point to make there uh, because it is something that they may not have a lot of exposure to uh, beforehand. Um, my personal lack of knowledge uh, on the extensive history. Hopefully, I, I hope our lessons uh, are useful for providing you some, some resources for teaching China, even if you don't have a lot of uh, knowledge of Chinese history. I thought in terms of going through these lessons, I see a lot of people are saying here um, they don't have a knowledge of the history. And again, I, I'm hoping our lessons are helpful for them. Uh, lack of background, narrowing it down. Uh, I think I, I'm hoping our lessons here help you to see some big subjects that you can talk about. And I think you know that covers a lot of different problems I think teachers usually run across. So what we're going to present to them. Moving on here to our lesson, our lessons, uh, we want to ask, what's the most challenging part of teaching Chinese history? So maybe people can put some answers over in the chat bar, uh, and we can talk a little bit about those challenges. Not enough time to teach all the good stuff. Yes, that would be a problem. There is a lot to learn. It is a long history. Many pre-existing biases. Any, any thoughts on what those pre-existing biases might be? The idea of dynasties can be challenging for students. Yes, that is definitely something that is hard to keep track of. Yes, the words are difficult, difficult to pronounce. Uh, and one thing you'll see in the lessons that we've provided and that we're going to be talking about today, and we do have a pronunciation guide uh, for each of the lessons. Well, welcome to the Common Core Does Not Have to Be a Great Wall, Fun Ways to Teach About China. My name is Keith Matea. I am a Senior Program Director here with the Constitutional Rights Foundation. And hi, I'm Carrie Doggett, and I'm the Director of Program at the Constitutional Rights Foundation. And we're thrilled to have so many of you joining us. We're seeing some of you are from the East Coast, some of you are local, and we have everything in between. I'm going to start off with a trivia question here. Uh, for you, those of you who don't know, one of the sort of greatest archaeological discoveries uh, in the world is the Terracotta Army in China. And we wanted to know uh, what percentage of the famous Terracotta Army has already been uncovered? Well, it looks like most of you do know the answer. The answer is 